In this module, we're going to talk about configuring TempDB. We're going to talk about why its configuration matters, like an internal bug, I would consider it in SQL Server, how you configure a new SQL Server, an existing SQL Server, where you should put the files, and then a few places to go for additional learning. TempDB is kind of like a scratch area. If you're a systems administrator, you can think of it as, say, a swap space for SQL Server. It's a place where it goes and scribbles things down that it needs to go and keep track of. For example, when queries are allocated workspace memory in order to run, they may not have enough memory granted to them, so they need a scribbling space to go and sort their data, keep track of data for parallelism, all kinds of stuff. That place for TempDB, or that place for SQL Server, isn't the swap file. It doesn't go out to the operating system swap file, although SQL Server's memory can swap, but SQL Server tries to not go there on purpose. It would rather go into this system database called TempDB. TempDB is a database, but the way that we use it is different. See, all those things over there on the left-hand side, they happen all the time time continuously 24 7 oh goodness i had to mute myself there no don't worry i'm not contagious it's just that i have asthma i may have other things that are contagious but it's not the thing that you're worried about so i don't know that went to a dark place really fast or a funny place really fast all those things over on the left hand side they happen all the time constantly 24 7. you can run a thousand ten thousand queries per second all of which, which need to do all of those things, which means that SQL Server is constantly hitting TempDB, but it's accessing it just like it would a database. And this causes problems. If I think about how often new objects are created and old objects are dropped, that almost never happens in system databases. It's not like you've got users in there constantly going, create database or create table, drop table, create table, drop table, like Kermit over on the keyboard. It might happen in user databases. Sometimes I see workloads where people actually create new tables and drop tables inside user databases, but it's still fairly unusual to see. But in TempDB, this happens all the time. All the time, 24-7, SQL Server's in there like Kermit at the keyboard going, create table, drop table, create table, drop table, just continuously creating and dropping objects in order to support all of the stuff that I've got over there on the left-hand side. So as a result, this causes a problem for SQL Server's internal architecture. It was just never simply designed to handle creating and dropping thousands of objects per second. It was never designed to handle constantly growing and shrinking thousands of objects per second. That's just not beha normal behavior for what SQL Server would consider a user database or a system database. It's just that they decided early on that they wanted to use a database to support all these activities. Well, in every database, there are a couple of special pages. There's a page free space page, which says, which says basically for each of the spaces inside this area of the database, there's this much free space available on each page. So if you were going to look to add rows to an object, here's where there's going to be space available for that object. And then there's these SGAM pages, Shared Global Allocation Map, which says that if you're just going to go create a few rows for a brand new object, here are some extents, some like 64K areas, where you could go and add those and there would be space available for you. This is super rare internal stuff. This is about as internal-z as I'm going to go inside that entire course. And you don't need to know the contents of these things. You don't really need to know what they need to do. But just knowing that they're there, this starts to complain or explain why SQL Server has a bottleneck with this. Every time that you go and create and drop objects inside a database, you have to temporarily get locks on those objects, those pages. And SQL Server needs to grab really lightweight locks, but there are only two of these objects per file per unit of size. Don't worry about it, but just as the file grows larger, you start to get more of these 8K pages. 
Well, the problem here then is that whenever I'm trying to create and drop objects constantly, these become bottlenecks inside TempDB. All the queries, or system processes, whatever, that want to go create or drop objects or load data or remove data from objects, they need to go get a latch, which is a really quick lightweight lock, on those two pages, on the PFS page and on the SGAM page. This locking problem that only exists really inside a TempDB, there are edge cases where you could see it in a user database, but it's extremely rare. It's just extremely common to see it over in TempDB. These latching and locking problems are not about disk storage. You don't have to get faster disks to solve this problem. And indeed, faster disks won't even help you when you're facing this problem. The problem is that both of these pages are actually stored up in RAM. We're not waiting to read them from disk. We're getting locked. Ooh, 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 ah, yeah. Boy, that went off topic real fast. But you know, you just can't not do that whenever you go. Do, 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 uh, whenever you get up like that. So this is why you have to surely there'll be a clip of this somewhere. Um, so anyway, as Ellen would say, uh, anyway, these two things are up in memory. Now I just immediately want to do it again, but now I'm so self-conscious of the da, 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 da. These two 8K pages are up in memory, and this, I'm never giving this session again without having 8K pieces of paper on my desk, because otherwise I'm going to constantly be doing that joke. That, I've never done that joke before. Trust me when I say this, I don't sit around doing that joke. I watch TikTok videos with it, but anyway. Even though those two AK pages are up in memory, uh, we still ha end up having locking and latching problems on them. Now the fix is going to seem really weird. In order to solve it, we have to add more tempdb data files. So if we add more tempdb data files, we're going to have more of these PFS and SGAM pages, and SQL Server will use them roughly evenly. So fixing this problem, avoiding this problem with TempDB, is just a matter of adding several small files. Now hold on for a second. If you've, if you've done any kind of Googling before about how you configure SQL Server, you probably read advice about that you should create a file for each core. If you have a whole bunch of CPU cores, the old advice, when Microsoft first discovered this problem, the old advice was to say, you should create a, a data file for every CPU core. Well, that ended up causing problems. You can have too many TempDB data files. So they ended up revising that, and they said, oh, you know what? You just need a few TempDB data files. All of a sudden, a siren goes by my, my office. Uh, house. It's not like I have a, a separate office. I'm at my house. Uh, so you just need more tempdb data files. It's not about the exact number. It's a, just about having mas, si, mas, si, mas, si, mas. So in order to fix it, in order to fix it, what you're going to do is you're going to create between four and eight equally sized tempdb data files, somewhere between four and eight. Some blog posts that you'll read will say you should use four. Some posts will say you should read eight. I don't know where these two original numbers came from. I'm fine with either one. I don't care whether people create four or whether they create eight. The exact number is less important to me than just creating masi, 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 mas. Um, in the mastering server tuning, we go into more details to how you go about monitoring TempDB to figure out whether you still have latch weight contention. Even after adding either four or eight files, we show you how to measure that it's happening and then how to go about finding the queries that are causing it. Now, when you, when you go in and add mossy, mossy, moss, um, if you're not sure about or what people will do is they'll say, oh, I must need much larger space. No, it's not about space. They just need to have four or eight equally sized files. So if you're dealing with a server that you're not sure how big the file should be, just look at the existing data file size, and I'll tell you how to go through and divide that here in a second. Then just make sure that the file sizes are equal because you can still end up with latch weight contention. SQL Server does uh, will use data files based on how much empty space they have. So if I have one of my data files that's way larger than the other, that one will end up becoming hot, getting much more activity on it simply by the fact that its data file size is larger. So that's why they need to all be equally sized.
So how do you reconfigure an existing SQL Server? It probably only has one TempDB data file today. What you do is look at the size of that, divide that by four. That's assuming you're going to use four data files. If you use eight, then divide it by eight. Ooh, 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 I am. Um, then go shrink the existing data file size all the way down or to whatever target size you're going to use. Then add three more equally data, equally sized files, and then restart the SQL Server service. Restarting the service just guarantees that SQL Server is going to use all of those files equally. You don't have to restart the SQL Server service when you do this. It's just that you're going to get equal TempDB uh, utilization across those PFS and SGAM files after you restart the server. So it's not mission critical that you go restart it right away. Now, where do you put these files? Sometimes people will say things like, it always has to be on solid state. It always has to be local. Well, let's go through a few pieces of this one at a time. First, does it need to be on solid state? Well, as I record this, it's the year 2020. Nothing should not be on solid state storage in the year 2020. My phone and your phone have flash storage. So should your database server. SQL Server is $2,000 US per core. Per core! Per CPU core is $2,000. So if you have an 8-core SQL Server, even just with Standard Edition, we're talking about $16,000 US. Hell yeah, it should be on solid state storage. Everything involving SQL Server should be on solid state storage. Two, the advanced, should it be on its own volume? Should you have a dedicated drive just for TempDB? The reason why people will usually think of that is because if you TempDB grows, by default, people can do all kinds of nasty things in TempDB. If they wanted to do a denial of service attack on your SQL Server, they could simply load stuff into TempDB until it fills up. There's not outside hackers doing that. That's your business intelligence department that goes about giving you those de uh, denial of service attacks. They'll go through and build these big, huge, ginormous temp tables. They won't realize that it's actually filling up a disk. And next thing you know, your SQL server is unusable because TempDB is full. So the, the advantage of putting it on its own volume is that you can say that when it grows, it won't and it fills up the drive, it won't impact other databases. I never really bought into that because when it fills up, Stuff stops working. So am I really saving anything? I'm not too sure about that. I get why people want to do it. I'm just like, if you really wanted to stop it from growing, you could turn off auto growth, and that achieves the same result. So I'm not really sure if that's what you wanted to do. The, the next two bullet points on there, though, different I.O. profiles for configurable storage, that can help. Sometimes you can have uh, storage that allows you to tune caching and access differently depending on which volume it's on. So you may want to, for example, turn off read caching on TempDB, and I'm just making this up, but if your SAN vendor says it wants TempDB on its own volume and it has different uh, access methods from there, sure, knock yourself out. In the cloud, you can also possibly get a separate I.O. limit. So with Azure uh, and Amazon, it's really common to see people put different things on different drives because different drives can have different IOPS, different throughput limits. The caution I would give you there, though, is that if you carve your SQL Server up into a whole bunch of really tiny volumes, generally with both Amazon and Azure, the size of the volume also dictated, dictates its performance. So if you use a whole bunch of 10 gig volumes or 50 gig volumes, you're going to get really crappy performance across all of them. In this class, this class, we're talking about servers at 100 gigs or less. At 100 gigs or less, I would really want everything on its own one vol everything on the same big one volume because you want to max out how much I.O. performance you can possibly get. Local NVMe storage or ephemeral storage up in, uh, uh, up in Amazon's cloud or Azure's cloud, this lets you use a separate bandwidth pipe for your user databases and a local bandwidth pipe for TempDB. That just gives you additional free storage. Because even though people will say things like, oh, I don't really care about TempDB, the the, um, I don't care if it disappears on restart, 
you care in the sense that if it isn't there and if the folders aren't there, SQL Server won't create the folders. So you just got to make sure that if you use local or ephemeral storage, if the server restarts, that the folders get created before SQL Server tries to store them, tries to start them. Otherwise, the wonderful advantages of local and ephemeral storage is that they're insanely fast, really low latency. And in the cloud, typically this lower latency storage is totally free. I could go on for two, three, four hours on TempDB, and there are people like Bob Ward who actually do, but in the, in the case of this fundamentals class, that's really all you need to know in order to get TempDB started. There are trace flags that you can consider playing around. I'm going to link to these in the fundamentals, in the uh, resources page for this module. Two trace flags that you could consider applying for SQL Server 2016 and earlier. For the scope of this class, for the fundamentals class, I'm not concerned whether people have that on or not. It's not that important of an issue. The third one, for SQL Server 2019, SQL Server 2019 added this new feature called Memory Optimized TempDB Metadata that's supposed to reduce the problems of uh, contention in TempDB even further. It's a version one feature. And as of this recording, there have been five cumulative updates for SQL Server 2019. Out of those five, three of them had corruption issues, one of them involving in-memory optimized TempDB metadata. There may come a point in time where I start recommending this feature, but as of this recording, July of 2020, I do not. I would like to see a little bit more stability to the point where not every other cumulative update involves corruption issues. After that, I might consider using new features like this.